So um, every morning, uh, that's probably not true, probably six out of seven mornings, um, I begin my day by opening up my Bible and do a little scripture reading. Um, on Wednesday this week, I grabbed this Bible. Um, this is the Bible that I have at home. I'm, I, I don't use it too much at church, but I think I might. It's kind of like a preacher's Bible. It's kind of big and heavy. I, I feel like, hey, I should open this up. Um, and I'm so glad I did this week on Wednesday um, because what I wanted to do was go through the text that we are going to look at today, which is watching Jesus go from his arrest to the cross, which was the darkest period in his life. He's betrayed, he's beaten, he's convicted of a crime that he didn't commit, and he's crucified. One of the darkest times of his life. And so, as I, I wanted to read that, and I'm so glad I had this Bible, because in this Bible, all the words of Jesus are in red. Um, and I've never really appreciated that until this week, because as I watched Jesus listen read as he was going through the darkest times in his life, the words jumped out of the page on me. Like they literally jumped out on the page so that I could say, oh, this is how Jesus responds in a very dark time. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to see how does Jesus respond in darkness? Now, a couple of things. Let me just say two things about the sermon today. First is, because I know so many kids are watching us online, what I use for the images to tell the story are Legos. So you're literally going to see the story of Jesus' darkest days with Legos. And I hope you enjoy it. I just wanted to make it like, because it's going to get dark, but I, it was just kind of a fun way for me to kind of think about that. So get ready for that. And kids, just pay attention. Watch the Lego images come up. And then second is we're going to see five responses. We're going to see five responses from Jesus. And I, uh, at the end of the sermon, I, I invite you to consider which of these five do you need for this week. Okay, so we're going to tell the story. The story where we are in the story of Jesus going towards the cross is he's already had Passover meal with his disciples. He's already left the Passover meal to go to the garden the Mount of Olives, to pray. Judas, one of his best buddies, one of his disciples, has already gone to betray him, and he's getting together with the, the people who are going to arrest Jesus. And that's where our story begins today. So they're in the garden. So check out this slide. It says, uh, Lord, shall we use our swords? I kind of hear that. That's how we hear the Legos talking. Shall we use our swords? Because this is what happened. So Jesus has finished praying with his disciples, and he has prayed that he could follow God's best will. He wanted God to take this from him. He prayed, God, can you take this from me? But he said, not my will, but thy will. And as he's talking to his disciples to also stay faithful in this dark time and not fall to temptation, Judas shows up with a group of people, some officers from the temple, the chief priests, some elders. They come to arrest Jesus. And as they begin to arrest him, the disciples see what's going on. And literally, one of the disciples says, Lord, shall we fight for you? Shall we use our swords? In fact, Peter, you know, the disciple who walked closely, he actually took his sword and made a swing at one of the folks and he cut off his ear. It's crazy. And then Jesus says this, when the violence begins, Jesus says, stop. I will have none of this. And he literally heals the man whose ear has been cut off. And at that point, we hear this. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come from him. Now, these are the words of Jesus. Listen to what he says about how we live. Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour, the hour when darkness reigns. That's heavy. So Jesus looks at the folks and says, man, why are you trying to start a rebellion? We're not here to fight. I was with you all the time and you didn't arrest me. But then he acknowledges what is true. This is the hour in which darkness reigns. 
what is super clear from Scripture is that there are times in our personal lives, there are times in the history of the world in which darkness is given a chance to reign, to move out. We experience sickness, we experience death. Bad things happen. And this is one of those times. It is the time in the life of Jesus, and he acknowledges it. What's also true in Scripture is darkness is limited. Like when Jesus says this is the hour that darkness reigns, he says it's only an hour. It's not literally an hour, 24 hours, but it's a limited time span. And this is clear from the beginning of Scripture to the end that God remains in control even when evil or darkness is, is allowed to move out and to reign, to do its work for a while. God never loses control. What I love about Jesus is that he is neither an optimist or a pessimist. Like, Jesus doesn't look at the world and say, oh, it's all going to be okay, no problem, just, just, just be good. He, he doesn't do that. Like, he's not just always optimistic. But he's also not a pessimist. He's not always like, okay, it's terrible. It's going to get bad, and it's going to stay bad, and it's always going to be bad, and this is just a bummer. He doesn't do that. I like to think of Jesus as a compassionate realist. I, just, I love that image for me because he knows the reality of the kingdom of heaven and he wants to see that on earth. And he also knows that we need to practice compassion when the hour of darkness is reigning. I discovered this verse uh, about a week and a half ago, Proverbs 14, 25. And it says this, a truthful witness saves lives. But a deceitful, but a false witness is deceitful. I think what we see in this first part of the text as Jesus is moving into the darkest time of his life is that when darkness reigns, we always need to speak the truth. We don't color it with Pollyanna optimism. We don't descend into nothing but fear and pessimism but we simply talk about the reality of the kingdom of God in our midst and follow that. This week, um, I had two different experiences of people who've had the COVID-19 virus, the coronavirus. There was a friend of mine who was in Colorado. He was in critical condition. He had had pneumonia, he couldn't breathe. He was in the hospital with the virus and there was a fear that he could die. A lot of us were praying, and as we prayed, it seems as though he's been being healed. Um, we got news yesterday that he's actually home. And what's so good about this is we know, like this is what's true. With this COVID-19 coronavirus, most of the people who are infected will recover. The percentages are on the side of life when it comes to this virus. And this is also true. There will be those who will die. A friend of mine called me this week and he let me know that um, his brother, who lives in New York, his brother passed away so quickly from this virus. Um, it broke my heart. I, I've known this man for 20 something years and when he called me, he told me the story how his, his brother had been sick, they had been tending at home like you're supposed to do, but once he, he couldn't breathe, they called the ambulance and the overwhelmed ambulance service, people didn't want to go into the house, it took some time and on the way to the hospital, his brother died. I had a hard time just wrapping my head around the loss of my friend. But then again, I always have a hard time on some levels wrapping my head around loss when I'm talking to someone who is grieving. A truthful witness saves lives, but a false witness is deceitful. But I, again, just Jesus, when he says, the, this is your hour, an hour when darkness reigns, he is simply saying, get ready, because it's going to be hard for those who want to stay faithful. But also, it's not, it's, it, God is with us and in control. God is controlling even the darkest times. So I've been thinking a lot about how do we pray during this time? Do we pray optimistically, God, just stop everything? Or do we pray pessimistically, God can't do anything? I actually think we pray as Jesus taught us to pray with the Lord's Prayer. 
I think right now in, in our culture, that prayer is foundational for us. Because remember what it says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, you acknowledge God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know that God has the ability to heal, but not everybody gets healed. We know that God can protect us, but not everybody is always protected. We know that God's will is for his kingdom to be manifested on this earth. And what does that look like? Well, sometimes it looks like going through a hard time that we become the people God has called us to be in the hard time. God doesn't remove the hour of darkness. He actually gives us strength to prevail in the hour of darkness. Life or death. I just love the Lord's Prayer because it says, God, your will be done right now. And then it says, give us this day our daily bread. In other words, the strength for today. It's such a good prayer. Can you guys feel it? Like this prayer, the strength for the day. Give us this day our daily bread and lead us not into a time of temptation or a time of testing, but deliver us from evil. So when we are experiencing fear, when we're experiencing this test to give up, this prayer frees us to say, God, I want to do your will. I will pray, I will pray, my prayers will be aligned with what you want. That's why this Lord's Prayer is so powerful for us right now as we pray it together. Because here's the deal, if we're going to speak the truth, some of us during this time will begin to falter a little bit in our faith. And I say that because in the time of Jesus, when he was going through his hard time, some of his disciples faltered. Um, check out this picture. So after Jesus is arrested, they take him to the court of the high priest. And one of his disciples follows, and his name is Peter. You may remember that Jesus has already told Peter that he's going to deny him three times. And he's already told him that stay with me because afterwards God has a big plan for his life. He warned him ahead of time. Okay, so Jesus is arrested, he goes to the high priest, and he goes to the high priest, Peter follows, and when he's in the court, the courtyard, someone says, a servant girl actually says, you were with him, weren't you? And he goes, I wasn't with him. Then someone else says, you were with him, weren't you? And he goes, I wasn't with him. He denies him twice. And then a third time, someone says, you were with him, weren't you? And a third time, Peter says, I don't even know the guy. And at that point, the rooster crows. And listen to what the text says about that. Right, when Je right as Peter said that, it says, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. I mean, can you imagine that? Like Peter wanted to be so faithful to Jesus and he denies him three times and he looks and Jesus looks him in the eye from the distance. You can only imagine what Peter was feeling because his faith had faltered. The Lord turned to look straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. When darkness reigns, our faith may falter, but it's not fatal. I want to say that again, because this is a critical point for us when we're trying to be faithful in the midst of darkness. When darkness reigns, our faith may falter, but it's not fatal. Jesus knew ahead of time that Peter was going to deny him three times, and he wanted to set him up for success, because he said, when it fails, remember, I told you it's going to happen. And the truth is, if you've ever gone through a time of darkness, a time of evil, um, many of us will have doubts. Many of us will question our faith. The, the, the problem isn't in the question or the doubts. The question is whether we will step up after we have failed. Because in the story of Jesus, there are two people who dis, uh, very distinctly reject Jesus. There is Judas who betrays him. And there is Peter who denies him. Judas never turns back to God, and his life ends tragically. 
Peter turns back. Like when our faith falters, it doesn't have to be fatal. It actually, God can use that as a time to build in us a greater faith. God can use that to build in us a more determined faith. Because I don't know if you've ever failed at something and you didn't want to, or you faltered at something. You, you know, if you, uh, I like the image of a boxer. If a boxer gets knocked down in the first round, but he's not knocked out, what does he have to do? He's got to get back up. And you just keep getting back up. You know, and this is what grace is. Grace is helping us to get back up. We don't do it on our own. God literally lifts us up. And what we're going to see in the life of Peter is literally he's still hanging on. Next week, we're going to see him run to the tomb because he's still there. After that, we're going to see how Jesus restores him to a place of leadership because he is still there. So in the midst of darkness, there might be times in which you feel like, man, I, I just can't do this anymore. You might be beginning to trip up or be overly tested. Please, please, please remember Peter. Because I do think that evil wants to take those times when we falter and bring us down. I do think evil wants to kind of give us in a little spin cycle to pull away from God. One trip and we think we failed completely. It's just not true. I'm going to speak the truth right now. Grace lifts us up. Grace empowers us to live in the midst of an hour in which darkness is reigning. Okay, so check out this next picture. It's kind of, I actually think it's kind of cool, the Legos. Um, so he's got this one Lego man. He's totally punching Lego Jesus in the stomach. And he's like, wham, like those old Batman things, like wham. And he's like, so who hate you? Let me explain this scene. So after Jesus goes to the high priest, they start accusing him, mocking him, and beating him. Peter denies him, and Jesus' life just gets darker and darker. And they're literally wailing on the guy just repeatedly, and they're mocking him because they have him blindfolded. Well, if you're a prophet, tell me who hit you now. Smack. And then you guys got to hear these words of Jesus because in the middle of this beating, this is what Jesus says. Jesus answered them, I tell you, but you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. Okay, so literally, like these folks are beating on him, and they're like, are you the Christ? Are you the Christ? And he's like, well, if I tell you, you're not going to believe me anyway, because you've already made up your mind. But I want to let you know what's true. When all this is over, I'm going to be sitting at the right hand of God. Evil cannot stop God's purposes. I love that image because it's almost like even though his body's getting totally beaten down, he's like, I got to let you know, I'm walking with the knowledge that God is always, God is always in control. And even though you think right now you're winning, it's not even close to a win because I will eventually end up seated at the right hand of God. So what I heard this week as I was looking at the words of Jesus is when darkness reigns, God is always in control. And God is always in control. If you were here last week, we talked about a verse that said those who wait or those who trust in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. That was spoken to a people who were in exile for 70 years and that was like, hey, man, I know it's really hard right now. 70 years, you're going to be stuck. But God's going to give you strength that you need because God is always in control, even when darkness reigns for a limited time. Like the coronavirus, it's not going to be here forever. How we live today in the midst makes all the difference in the world. And how can we live well? Remembering that even in all that might happen this week, God is always in control. One of the times that I learned this lesson, I've learned it repeatedly over and over in my life, and I think most of us have these repeated lessons we keep learning, is I had a good friend of mine who was in the emergency room. This was years ago. And she had this just really strange disease that was called by the spores that are in the hills. It's this really crazy thing. Um, and she was dying. Like, literally, she was dying in the emergency room. And she is such a faithful woman. Um, she even knew, like, once she recognized that she could die, she said she went at peace. 
because she knew whether in life or in death, God was always in control. And then she said this, which kind of made me laugh. As she was dying, she was thinking, okay, at least there's no more lists. I have no more lists I need to make. I have nothing else I have to get done because she is such a focused, great worker, focused mom. She would make lists. And so like she's literally dying in the hospital and she's like, okay, at least I don't have to worry about anything anymore. She was that confident in God's control. And this is what happened to her. God actually healed and brought her back. She didn't die. She was, it was close, but she didn't die. She lives today, and she is focused on living a God, proclaiming his faithfulness. It was actually in her darkest times that God lifted her up so that she could now live now as a strong woman of prayer and of faith, as she can now share her story. When darkness reigns, God is always in control. Okay, okay, so I totally want, I, would, I just wanted to tell people this story. Um, right now, and maybe this is, Jenny told me this is happening across the country, but only one guy on our street has done this. He put up his Christmas lights. Has anyone else seen that? You guys seen people putting up their Christmas lights? Okay, he put up his Christmas lights, and he has a big, you know, Christmas decorations up. It's like he's just two houses down from us on the corner. And I got to tell you, I am super stoked about that because in the night when I drive by, I'm like, oh, the Christmas lights. So like, I think it was two days ago, he was outside and I'm a couple of houses down. So I see his Christmas lights. And so I just kind of yell, ho, ho, ho. And he goes, Tommy, I just got to let you know, we need a little light right now because there's a lot of hard things happening. I just want to proclaim that. And I just thought that is such a good image because you guys remember the basic the basic message of Christmas, it's one word, Emmanuel. And what does that mean? God with us. And so every time I see his Christmas lights, I'm like, Emmanuel, there is no darkness that can overcome the light. There is a period when we go through hard times, but the light is always there. I love the message of Christmas for that reason. God came into the darkness, became the light of the world for us. In fact, I'm so tempted to put up Christmas lights this week. I might. We'll see. We'll see what happens. So we see that God is always in control. And now let me tell you some of the rest of the story, because this story, it, it starts moving forward and it gets darker. So Jesus is with the high priest. They beat him. They mock him. He says, I'm going to end up on the right hand of God. Then they take him to one of the Roman rulers whose name was Pilate. So because they can't put him to death, they want him to die, but only the Romans can put him to death. And so they take him to Pilate, and Pilate interviews him, and Pilate's like, I don't see anything wrong with this guy. I mean, he might be, think he's something, but I don't see anything worthy of death. And then they, the, the chief priests and folks are accusing Jesus of all kinds of stuff, and they mention he's from Galilee. And Pilate says, oh, well, let's send him to the leader of Galilee, whose name was Herod. So then Jesus goes from Pilate to Herod, and I mean this in the kindest way. Herod was a buffoon. He was a leader. He was smart. I mean, incredibly smart. Did a lot of things but he was a buffoon. And what I mean by that is, like Jesus is going through the hardest time of his night, and Herod, literally it says, Herod really wanted to see him because he thought maybe Jesus could perform a miracle. Like he just wanted, come on, Jesus, perform a miracle for me. That's kind of, and it, he's having like a party with his people, and Jesus shows up, and, he, and Jesus, this is what Jesus says to Herod. When Herod says, show me a miracle, Jesus says this. He doesn't say a word. While he spoke to Pilate, he won't speak to Herod. For me, it, it just reminds me is that, um, what's that phrase? Don't suffer a fool. Like when you're confident in what God is doing, if people are mocking or doing things, we don't have to, we don't even have to respond to the foolish things that people do. It's powerful. So then Jesus is a, uh, they, they, this is what I mean. So they literally put like a robe on him, like, oh, he's the king of the Jews. And they put like a thing on his head. They beat him a little bit more. They're just mocking him completely, and they send him back to Pilate. Now listen to this. So Pilate interviews him again, and he's like, there's nothing wrong. This guy, this guy's okay. 
And so he says to the people who want him crucified, he says, I don't find anything wrong with this guy. I'm going to have him beaten a little bit more, and then I'm going to let him go. And they're like, no, you can't do that. And then they say something like, give us Barabbas. And it's really interesting. Barabbas was a guy who was trying to overthrow Rome, and they were calling for what they call an insurrection. They were calling for an insurrectionist. And then he's like, well, what do you want me to do with Jesus? Pilate asks the people. And they say, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate's like, but he hasn't done anything wrong. And they're like screaming, crucify him, crucify him. And it's at that point that Jesus is condemned to be crucified. Now remember, he has been beaten. He has been whipped and scourged. His body is just trounced. And they give him a cross to carry so that he might be crucified. On his way, the Romans see that he's not going to make it. They seize a man named si Simon, who is from a, uh, this place called Cyrene. And Simon helps them to carry the cross. Jesus says these profound words to the women about how evil is reigning right now. And then they get to the place of crucifixion. And I don't know if you guys remember this, but he was actually crucified with two other people. And as he was crucified with two other people, what was happening was as he was being crucified, people continued to mock him. They continued to kind of say things like, well, if you're the Messiah, save yourself. Why don't you call down all these things from heaven? He's like, they're mocking him. And even one of the guys who's being crucified next to Jesus also mocks him. He says, man, if you're the Messiah, don't just save yourself, but save us. Like this one dude is just totally like mocking and self-centered, asking to be saved. But then there was another guy. Listen to this. Oh, let me, sorry, I'm looking for my page. Well, here we go. In Luke chapter 23, it says this. Two, men, two other men, both criminals, were led outside with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him along with other criminals on his right side and the other on his left. And Jesus said, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes. Isn't that interesting? Like in the middle of his darkest time, literally on the cross, Jesus speaks a word to all those who are mocking and crucifying. And he says, forgive them. How does light overcome darkness? One of the ways is forgiveness. I mean, can you like imagine if, people, if they were listening, because sometimes when people are mocking, they don't listen. But can you imagine what someone would have felt? They're doing their worst to Jesus, and he just simply says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They're caught up in this evil. They're caught up in this ploy. Please forgive them because they're ignorant to what's going on. Forgiveness has the power to break darkness. How do we live in a time when darkness reigns? And how do we live through very difficult things? Man, we need to be people of forgiveness. Again, when we go back to the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Give me the strength I need for today. Forgive me my sins as I forgive those who sin against us. Sin against me, sin against us. It's a plural. Forgiveness frees us to keep our eyes on God even when things look really dark. Like this week, next week, there might be people who make you mad because of how they're acting or from what they say. You might see things in the news that make you super angry for whatever reason. Forgive. Everyone's trying to figure it out right now. None of us has gone through this. We're literally not knowing what we're doing. Forgive, for they don't know what they're doing. And trust me, when people are angry at you because we, you don't know what you're doing, we're going to want forgiveness. Because if we don't practice forgiveness, what happens in our homes? the darkness just spirals out of control because we're just focused on ourselves. What happens in our country if we don't practice forgiveness? Like, it just, it spirals out. We have mocking, we have anger, we have people saying, you did this, you did this. 
Um, but forgiveness is one of those things that as Christians, as we have received the forgiveness of God, we can rest in his forgiveness so that forgiveness can literally pour out of us. And I believe bring healing to broken homes and to a broken country. When darkness reigns, forgive always. And check this out. Jesus didn't do that because he was God. He was able to forgive because he had already asked God to give him the strength that he needed. And he, as a human being, he was probably tempted, or he was tempted to not forgive, but he forgave because he knew that was the way to bring light into dark places. So he's on the cross, and then we have what I mentioned earlier, the mocking, the accusation. We have the, the other criminal who's also mocking Jesus, and this is Jesus' response at that point. So the one criminal mocks him, and then, he's, but, and then it says this, but the other criminal rebuked the one criminal and says this, don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are being punished justly for what we are getting for our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Okay, so in the midst of this horrid time of crucifixion, the one guy is mocking Jesus, saying, oh, save us too. And then the other guy's like, whoa, whoa, dude, you don't get it right now. We actually deserve to be up here because we committed a crime. But this man, this guy who just said, forgive them for they know not what they're doing, this guy's done nothing wrong. Like this guy in the midst of the chaos is seeing clearly who Jesus is. And I love this next phrase. Then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. So he gets it. He's like, this guy's done nothing wrong. All the chaos is happening. He's literally dying. And he looks at him and says, please remember me. You are truly the king of kings. When you get to your kingdom, remember me. And listen to Jesus' response to the man who asked to be remembered. I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. In the midst of darkness, in the midst of the worst day, no question of Jesus' life. He is loving the person who is dying with him, who asks. Isn't that powerful? Like, when darkness reigns, all of us have a choice. Will we enter into the darkness and spiral out of control with the darkness, or will we allow the light of God to touch us and ask God to, to show us what we need to know to, to bring us into paradise. Like literally, we have to make a choice. Are we going to listen and follow what God wants for us, hear that Jesus is offering us life or spiral out of control? See, this scene on the cross, a lot of people um, have used it to just say, even to our last moment, we can ask God into our lives. Which I find fascinating because on the cross, there were two people who asked to be saved. One asked with a mockery or an intent that wasn't honest and true. Like literally, we can see that in the text. The other asked with a heart that wanted to acknowledge who Jesus was and longed for him. And in the midst of darkness, in the midst of rain, when darkness is raining for its time period, we too need to make a choice. I don't know if you've noticed here, Palm Sunday, on Palm Sunday, often the palms represent a celebration of who Jesus is because he's going into the city and they're celebrating he's the Messiah, not realizing that the palms could be a distraction to his purpose, and that's the cross. So like if I were to uh, shift this stuff around, you would see hiding under the palms is the cross because the cross is God's answer to darkness. <laughs> the cross is God's answer to forgive. I mean, forgive. How do we forgive? Because God forgave us. How do we know God forgave us? Because Jesus died on a cross. How do we face life when we know that there's death? Well, Jesus died on a cross and overcame death. And next week, that's what we're going to celebrate. Like when we get here to celebrate on live stream, and we're going to do an early morning service, we're going to celebrate this truth. And I can think of no better year for us to celebrate Easter. Because we know darkness does not reign forever. 
We know that God has power over that. And we know that as we live faithfully in the, the challenges that God has given us, we will experience the blessing in life or in death. That's the power of the gospel. All right. So there's been five things we've talked about today. And I would just love for you to think about which of those, for me it's all of them, but just, just, just choose one. Like which of those do you need to hold on to today as we move into the next part of this week and next week and anything that might be happening in your home or even in our country or, or around the world? First, when darkness reigns, speak the truth. Speak the truth of God's presence with us. Speak the truth that God encourages us. He, he, he buoys us up in hard times. Speak the truth. And I would even say pray the truth. Pray the Lord's Prayer. When darkness reigns, faltering faith is not fatal. When our faith falters, get back up. Let grace pick you back up. Let grace put you back into a place. Like if you've been faltering a little this week, I'm glad you're with us today and be with us next week because God's going to lift you up. When darkness reigns, God is always in control. Always. God is, I can't say it enough, God is always in control. I love the image of Christmas, Emmanuel. God is with us and God has never left us. He is with us. When darkness reigns, forgive always forgiveness can break the power of darkness forgiveness in god's love for what christ has done in us breaks the power of darkness in us and we can share that with the world and when darkness reigns you literally we i we have to make a choice am i going to stay connected to the god of the universe who is with us in this time or am i going to let darkness win in my life and fall away it's really powerful this week. I just have to share. I had two, um, two folks who talked to me via Facebook and one via email. One I hadn't seen, I haven't seen in years, haven't seen him for probably 20, 25 years or so. And he wrote me and said, hey Tom, I just wanna let you know that I'm getting back to God right now. With all that's happening, I'm getting back. And then there was another person who wrote me and uh, she was expressing how this process right now is drawing her back to prayer. She always knows that prayer is her only hope and prayer is more than enough kind of thing, but she's just drawn, being drawn back. These are like two folks, I, and, I, and as I read their email, one email, one Facebook, I just thought, that's right, all of us need to make a choice. Where are we gonna put our energy? Where are we gonna put our time? Where are we gonna put our prayer over these next couple of weeks? I'm so looking forward to being together on this journey.